Ryan Kraut Kramer is on episode five of the Dom Joseph podcast. What is up, Ryan? Hey guys, I am psyched to be here, man. I've been following your stuff for a while and I have nothing to say other than I'm so proud. Thanks, man. This is five episodes is, you know, even when I was had Thomas on the show, it was like three is like, damn, like it's already kind of not right. taking off, but it's it's getting to the point now where it's like we're almost in double digits, like yeah. weekly takes in 19 now. That's amazing, man. And, you know, I look at it and say, like, we're only getting older. You know, might as right. well just grind out stuff like this and just keep continuing to do that. Because I know after, you know, pe- people who are in high school and people who know us, you know, know that we're 21, you know, we're working on who we are now. But it, it's crazy to look at, like, we could look in a middle school fucking yearbook now. And it's sad to say, we could see people that have passed. We could see people who have kids now. We could see people who are married. We could see people who have made drastic changes in their life. What What do you take away from looking at a yearbook nowadays? Like, if you looked at a yearbook, like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. a total middle school year, <laughs> mi- like yearbook. God, man, it's nostalgia and the overwhelming sense of how fast time moves. Yeah. It, how fast years fly by and all of a sudden, you know, you're six or seven years removed from schooling and you're trying to live this life and you feel like you just turned 18. You're just getting out of high school and it's hard to figure out sometimes. I feel like the shift from 18 to 21 was the fastest amount of like years of experience because yes. from 15 to 16, I would say that was probably the longest because, you know, you don't have a car yet. Right. But trapped in your house. You're trapped. And like when you're 18, it's like, all right, you're an adult, but not really. Not really like yeah. you're, It's like, yeah, you still live at home. You still do this. But, you know, 18 was a weird age. Like yeah. you're legal, you know, but that's not the thing. It's more of like when you're 21, I feel like that is the fucking real legit you get age. All of the benefits of yep. being an adult, but at the same time, you have all of the responsibilities. Yeah. Yes. Because people look at you and you're you're not a kid anymore. You're young, but yeah. you're a young adult. They're like, okay, well, you're still going to get tried as an adult. Yeah. You're nine years from 30. <laughs> 25 years old, I feel like that is like, okay, you're in a, like, you don't get no sympathy no more. You're 21, they're like, okay, mm. we get it. Baby face trying to get your stuff together. Yeah, they're like, okay, that's you know. cute. You know, look at him. He's got his own car, signed his first <laughs> lease. Got his first heartbreak, got his first marriage, you know, they're like, okay. But then like, you know, you move into 25. It's like, that sucks, dude. Yeah. You know, you're going to go to jail. Yeah. If if, if (laughs) you screw up, if you fuck up, you're going to be facing some consequences. That's not even like with legally, like if you're living by yourself and you don't have the excuse of I'm young, I'm inexperienced. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, or you should at least people that are there's a you know i almost feel like here's the thing like you know they're in upbringings a lot of people like to blame the people who haven't had a lot of good times like you know the people who've had shitty um childhoods obviously right. you know there's statistics that show they don't do as well but i'd almost argue people who have it the best and the people who have nannies that have 21 nannies who raise them and people who do that they're almost it's more harsh to get hit in the face for them because they you know, they move out into their own house and they don't know how to fucking boil water. Right. It, right. It's a slap in the face. A hard slap in the face. And I I see issue with how big of a wealth gap we have in this, yeah. this country right now. And it's pretty evident in a lot of colleges out there um, having people come from far away places with extravagant amounts of money mixed with people from, you know, places where they're getting all their money from scholarships and they've... Uh, gotten financial support their whole lives it's two crazy different sects of human culture yeah. coming together and it's interesting to see how it how it all comes together yeah because when you're when you're put in a situation where you never have to do anything and you're watching people going you know yeah that's my butler right and you're like dude have you ever folded clothes in your life before right and they like and they're always the ones to judge the people that are poor yeah. because well, they're in reality it's a fucking reflection of what they're going through mm-hmm all these people who like to be butthurt all the time and always want to pe- put people down is because they're the ones that are facing with the insecurities. This guy's probably so insecure, this fictional guy making up that uh, there's nobody, it's just right. someone with like a butler who makes a lot of money. He's super insecure that he can't do the certain things that people who are grinding out can do. And that's why he can pick, oh, where well, you're wearing fucking something from the Goodwill. Yeah. And it's like, that's his high. When in reality, that could hurt him. 
You know, it's like a reflection. Right. People are just bags of fucking hurtfulness and just all this, you know? Yeah, and uh, across race, across everything, mm-hmm. I think the big thing that all humans share is the ability to, to feel the same pain in a lot of different ways. Yeah, what, what do you mean by that? Heartbreak feels the same mm-hmm. whether you're rich or poor. Yep, <laughs> Usher's heart pain is the same as the heart pains that you or I are faced. Right. And uh, that is fucking nuts. Yeah. Obviously, we weren't in, you know, his position and he wasn't in ours. But I couldn't imagine, like, people thinking that it's different. Right. Heartbreak is universal. Animals go through it. Yeah. You know? Fucking, you know, you see a pug and he sees another pug getting with his pug girlfriend. He's going to feel the same pain we see when we see a girl that we like fucking like someone's comment. Right. You know, or, like, you know, it's just little shit. Mm-hmm. And I just don't get how people would. It's so selfish to say, "Oh well, since I'm rich, my heartbreak's worse." Or my, right. you know what? You don't get it. That's my favorite word you nowadays. We were just talking it. about this before the show. The "you don't get it" card. That you know right. what that is? It's an excuse for why they can't do something. Right. You know, if you had an example where someone just says, "You know what, Ryan? You don't get it, man," or or actually, they could even go, "You're so privileged." You know, and they're just like, man, you had a good head start kind of thing. Isn't that exhausting? Yeah. I couldn't imagine living like that, pointing fingers and blame deflecting on people. It is so hard to live your life having this, like, competition with other people, right? We all have a different starting point and a different ending point, and the race is completely different for everyone. So it's unfair to yourself, mostly, to come out and say, oh, I'm not doing as good because this person has this, or I'm doing better because this person has this, and I'm better than that person. We all have such unique lives that we live that it's impossible for people to compare, right? We all have such different depths in our experiences that it's it's unfair to just project these things. And, the, like, standardized testing is a good example of this. We yes. have the same requirements for so many different types of people. It doesn't work. That's why we have bad test takers and good test takers because people are made for that stuff and people aren't made for that stuff. Are it's you made for that kind of stuff? Hell no, man. You're not good with standardized testing? It's tough for me to sit in a room and look at all these questions and try and get it going in my head. I'm a very visual, hands-on type of learner, so it, an ideal test for me would be giving me the thing as a physical item and telling me to fix it or go at it or whatever. But seeing it all put on paper is just so difficult to get the gears in your head turning to get the right answer but there's some people who can just snap that stuff out like nobody's problem they have this retention in their head that lets them absorb this information and blow it back onto the paper and i envy that a lot but i have strengths in places where they don't have strengths it's all about understanding that difference between everybody that we have strengths where people don't have strengths and they people other people have strengths that where you don't and we can all benefit from that there's no point in having this tribalism yes and and bickering of who's better which group is better when everybody's the same in different ways. It's like, do what you're fucking good at and what you like to do. Right. And don't put other people down for doing what they like to do unless it's a bad thing, yeah. obviously. But. And here's the thing, too. Like, it's, you know, I get people have fucking, you know, lives and they got to support people. Right. And I, that's still not an excuse. No. I, here's the thing. You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put it like a, I'm going to put someone like, like you, like in a, that's working a full time job. Right. They like to make the, well, I work a full-time job excuse. Okay, so when you come home, how many hours of Fortnite do you play? <laughs> Not you. Right. You know, how many fucking, all this bullshit that you say you're doing, how much? How many hours are you on Instagram looking at girls in bikini pictures? You know, like, people don't be, like, so, if, okay, so here's the thing. So, <laughs> so sorry, I'm kind of rambling here. So you come home from work, you have eight-hour work day, and you say you love to do something, put an hour away a day to do that. At least. You, if you can't put an hour away out of your day, if you're, I don't even know if there's someone, you know, probably The Rock, Kevin Hart, those type of guys are busy every hour of the day. Oh, yeah. I understand that. But, like, let's be honest. We're not the fucking Rock. That guy exhausts me, bro. Right. Like, just looking at, like, or just seeing how, can you imagine being that fucking busy? Or uh, Elon Musk. Yeah. Working, imagine being that. What, like 160 hour weeks? Yeah. Are you kidding if me? If that. Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. Donald Glover working on everything, music, movies, th- TV shows. Keegan Michael Key, people who are spreading themselves so thin and being so successful at it. And I bet it's because they separate their time 
and let themselves have an hour or two a day for something that they love, that they don't have to have any, the commitment that they have for other things to, that helps them decompress. It's like, put your fucking phone down right, for a little bit, you know? It, it's not, I, I say it's not hard, because I, I, it's hard for me, and I could admit that. You know, I'm on social media all the time. Well, I'd say, it's, I'd say it's hard for everyone. Yeah, it's hard. A lot of the stuff is made to be addictive. Yeah, and like, I just, here's the thing, when, you, like I was going, going back to what I was saying, like, here's the thing, like, you gotta make time for something you love to do. You like playing basketball? Put an hour away to do basketball and just basketball. You like to fucking cook? Make fucking dinner every night or do something that you love to do and stop complaining, well, I don't like this job. Okay. Work your job, maintain your the people you got to support, and then work what you like to do on the side and throw away the shit that isn't benefiting you. Yes, watching Forensic Files or watching fucking the X-Men Wolverine series every fucking weekend isn't going to get you much unless you're doing a podcast on the theory of X-Men. Right. Like, put maybe you don't have to watch all the movies. Put one movie time slot away to do something you love. You like to fucking knit? Knit. See how productive that is. Yeah. All of a sudden you have a pair of socks that you have to pay for. And you don't mind doing it because right. it's something you love to do. Mm-hmm. Find what you love to do. That is the most most important thing yeah, you could tell anybody. Really. Yeah. Um, Easier said than fucking done. Oh, though. God. If you know what I mean? I'll go into that right yeah. now if I um, share a story. I Most of my friends have moved out to Pullman, yeah. which is the way life goes. Mm-hmm. And I've been stuck out in... Shit town, Marysville. <laughs> as Shit t- much nothing as I for love. me here. <laughs> Shit town. We'll get um, to that little rant here yeah. in a second. But um, you know, I work hard, mm-hmm. and it's and sometimes it's it's difficult to find motivation to continue to do the things you love when you have such instant gratification directly in front of you. You have Netflix, Hulu, endless amounts of entertainment that you could dispose yourself at, and you wouldn't get anything productive done. And I spent a good amount of 2018 sort of just wallowing in in my, oh, I'm working too much, I don't have enough me time, I gotta go to sleep early, whatever. The the fact of the matter is, if, you, if it matters to you, you will make time for it, and it will be beneficial. I started hiking recently again, I started walking recently again, just getting out of the house, doing something other than being stagnant, and the difference in my mental state has been huge. Because I'm doing something that I love, even if it's for 30 minutes, even if it's for 25 minutes out of the day, I'm doing something that betters me and make is productive to myself personally, and it makes my life have more value. And I think a lot of people get stuck in the rut of, oh, I, I don't have enough money to do this, or I have to make up an excuse because it's something that f- feels like there's too much effort. When in reality, if you just push through that small wall that you've built yourself, it's so much worth it. You know, it's it's something that'll change your m- mood night and day. Yeah, and 90% of people who are listening to this, you know, have a fucking... I, I'm going to go as far as saying 95% of people who are listening to this have a fucking smartphone. Yeah. You know, and man, I want to be a YouTuber. Dude, your phone is a camera, a fucking mic. It can, it can post to the internet. You could be a YouTuber. This is a start. You know? And just people like like to make excuses. The one uh, a personal exper- mm-hmm. excuse that I've been making for a while is oh, I have to have a DSLR to take pictures. Yes, and I oh, I've done that with this. I yeah. did that with this podcast with the mics. Right. My 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 camera broke a little while ago, and I've just been pushing off replacing it. But it's something that I love to do. So why would I not pursue that? Oh, it's too much money. Oh, it's not a commitment that I want to make right now. But I'm gonna be the same age when I get when I you know maybe the same age in six months. Maybe in a, in six months I'll have a camera, and if I don't have a camera in six months, then I know I failed. Like you're gonna be the same age no matter what. Why not start now? Yeah. Why not get going on something now? Why not use your phone as a layover? In my example, to take pictures until you get a DSLR or something that works for you. Yeah, there's some badass iPhone pictures I've seen. Yeah, and like obviously not to DSLRs, you know, quality, but like you could still capture a moment. Right. And with an iPhone. And what sets it apart is your own personal talent yeah. or your own personal view on it. Because you, if you put enough work into it, enough practice, like everybody knows, you get good at things. Yeah, and it's just doing it. Sitting down and doing the work is the big thing. And a lot of yeah. people don't like, to, well, here's the thing. I, I like to connect it to this podcast. 
a lot of, you know, here's the thing. My first episodes, yes, my friends and family, thank God for you guys. I'm not going to get as much likes and retweets and all this metric stuff that I would want, but I can't let it do that. You got to be consistent with things. And like you just said, as soon as like, ever since you started walking and you're hiking more, it's just like your life is like, whoa. And nobody said you have to make money off the things you like to do. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, well, I want to do the side hustle and I want to make money. Okay, do it. But like your passion don't need to make money. Mm-mm. You know what I mean? Like, yes, it's a nice cherry on top. Right. But at that point, like you said, like you don't, I, I'm guessing you don't expect money from hiking a mountain and no. hike, walking. No. So like, no. and you're finding just as much happiness as you would as if like, maybe as much as like you get paid sometimes, yeah. you know, it's like a subtle thing you could achieve without worrying about money. Right. And to go off that point of money, I think that we're at a point in our society where we put so much value on money that it seems unnecessary or stupid to do something that doesn't make yourself money. Right. Um, I've had family members come to me and say, Oh, why do you take these pictures or why do you go on hike mountains when you could be working a job or whatever to get out of the house or do something? It's not all about money. And the more value we put on money, the more we let ourselves become a cog in this machine, a pawn to somebody else's will. We're suddenly not living the life we want. We're living the life John Doe at Megacorp wants, you know? We're trying to separate from that. So you have to find things that give you spiritual fulfillment, give you mental fulfillment, give you things that are cathartic, things that you can't buy. Um, I was talking to that about that point with Thomas experiences are fucking worth more than buying something materialistic 10 times more, you know, like, and obviously there's some things that could go into products that make experiences like these mics. Right. Um, but no, it's just, I'd rather buy a trip somewhere than buy a fucking, I don't know, a new fucking TV iPad or or something, you know, like it, it gives me way more happiness and way more memories. Like a picture with my bros from seven years ago, Mm -hmm is way more impactful for me to see like, oh, there's my iPad I bought a couple of years ago. You right. know, like, yes, it's got me right. out of some heydays, you know, but hey, like that's that's what it's all about, you know, yeah. it's experiences and not being part of the system. What are you going to carry to your end? Yeah. You're going to carry memories the entire way there. Yeah. And, and is your legacy going to be, I worked 80 years at a company that never gave me a raise, or is it going to be, I kind of scraped along, but damn did I spend some time in Europe and damn did I go on some great adventures with my friends and I climbed this mountain and I went here and I saw this I had this experience life isn't measured on the dollar amount you have when you croak right? and a lot of people think it is yeah which don't is, get me wrong though money like is so money important. money is important and it, it, it values a lot it devalues and values of a lot of things of people who and what they do mm-hmm. but that's not the point of it it like what it shouldn't be, but it is, you know, yeah. and that's, it's going to be like that regardless. Right. But ever since, what was the first time that you, you looked at money and you saw how much power it was? Like where I, you were like, fuck, <laughs> like either this is like, I'm broke and I can't do shit. Or you're like, damn, I could waste this whole paycheck on gambling. And I could, you know, what was the first time that you were like, damn money? Right. This is a real <laughs> thing. Well, man, Doing your first, like, legitimate budget, sitting down, pulling up spreadsheets, typing in the amounts that you make, and seeing that number after all your expenses. Like, the first time I did that, it felt like someone punched me in the face. I have $60 for food this month. Oh, I got $20 to spend this entire month on fun stuff, you know? It's like, wow. What it did for me is give me the perspective of, of money being this resource, like food, water. You need it to continue your journey in life. You need it to be successful at some level, whatever that may mean. Um, it's it's crazy. I did not have that much respect for money just because I thought it was stupid and, you know, something I used irresponsibly in a way that probably wasn't, you know, the best, having a disposable income at 18, living at home, going to have great adventures and fun times instead of trying to do the responsible thing. Of course, there has to be a balance there, but responsibility is very important. Um, no, looking at that final number and seeing that is just such a deflating feeling. But at the same time, making that budget go for five months or six months and then seeing that number in your savings account start to grow and grow 
to where you get to the point where you're like, damn, I have, you know, some money to throw around here, things that I care about and love. Uh, that's an incredibly fulfilling feeling. Yeah. I think the biggest problem that I've ever had with money is just getting over the getting over myself and saying, oh, I, I don't want to wait this long to get the things that I want. It takes time to save money, but once you get there, it's just the most worth it thing. It's in like the you don't even want the thing anymore. Right. Like, have you ever wanted something for longer than three months and you're like, well, do I really need it? Right. Or even like a day. Like, you're like, man, I really want that fucking shirt. You wait, you go home. Damn, I didn't really need that shirt. Right. You know, you Are buy you like a $20 meal instead and you're like, that was way more fulfilling than... That's the thing people fucking need to slow down on. Fast food. Eating, eating out. out. Man, it's a social it's thing. It's hard, only. dude. It's It's... I almost feel like eating, eating out, isn't well. Isn't <laughs> I feel like eating out at restaurants isn't even for people who like the food. It's just the social gathering. Yep. You know. That's. I, What's your thoughts on those kind of I, places? What What are your thoughts on going out to eat? The, I'm scared of how accessible it is. At this point in time, we have Uber Eats, you have Grubhub, you have all these things that'll deliver food to your door at what seems to be and economical costs and whatnot. And and I've been sucked into this. I think me and my girlfriend both have been sucked into this, living at home, getting food. You know, you, have, you, eat, out, you eat out two times or three times, you order food two times or three times a week, and you end up spending almost $100 when you could have gone to the grocery store and meal prepped for seven days with that amount of money. But it's the with convenience. Snacks. Yeah, with snacks and everything. It's the convenience that you get, though, that makes you think that it's worth it at the time. Or like, oh, I don't want to make food. I want to go somewhere, you know, have a good time, talk. I don't have to do the work for the food that I want to eat. But how, you know, how much time are you going to spend getting in the car, driving to the restaurant, waiting for the food to come out when you could have just been at home, whipping something together that would have tasted just as good. You would have been in the comfort of your own home and you would have spent a fraction of the amount of money. You don't got a tip. You don't got a tip. Yeah. You you know, you don't got to worry about getting stuff spilled on you. Spitting your food. Yeah. I just, I love eating out. Oh, it's a great social It's a time. great thing, but it's expensive. Yes. And I almost feel like eating out. There's been times where I go on trips, and I'll go out to eat five times a week, and it's like I feel sick. Oh, my God. Have you ever yeah. felt that, where you're just like, I'm not eating that well? It's like it's not like the food's bad. Right. But it's, it's just like, I just feel like it's there's so much spices, so much yeah. salt, and so, so much. So much fat, sugar, all these bad things yeah. that you should be saturating your body with. And you're like, this isn't that good. I just yeah. kind of want like a can of like fucking green beans, rice, and fish. Right. You know, and maybe that's like the weirdness in me, but I'd rather have like chicken and rice, dude. I'm fucking basic and shit like that. Yeah. And, but I, I know the thing is why I, I just keep doing it. Right. Because well, I, I know the feeling I've got to get. Yeah. There's a, I, th- I feel like there's a science behind it too. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't pull it from my memory, but I'm sure I've seen somewhere a study linking fat and sugar in in uh drinks and food at fast food to being somewhat of an addic- addictive thing people go through withdrawals and it stimulates the brain in the same way some drugs do so i think there's a legitimate not addiction but like craving for fast food or food that's made at a restaurant because it's filled with so much more fat so much more sugar it tastes so much more better than the stuff you could possibly make at home but at the same time it's so much worse for you Pop is a big thing, or soda, or soda pop, or however you say it. You know, people, all people say it differently. Right. But that's an, another addicting thing. Oh, my God. And don't get me wrong, I fucking love pop more than uh, anyone, you know? But, like, recently I've said, the past year I've just been drinking water. Not just water. I've had right. fucking pop in the past two weeks. But, you know, it, it's just like, wow. You don't realize how hooked you are on something until it's you don't really have it as much. You Seriously. know, it's... It's like pop is just so much more exciting because water is so bland, you know, but people who say water has no taste. I mean, it's true, but like, are you fucking kidding me? You can't drink a glass of water. Drink some water. People who don't drink water. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Man, I just want. Face looks like the moon. Oh. Nut battery acid. Dude, could you, if I told you you had to drink Mountain Dew for two straight weeks, no water. You'd find me in the ER <laughs> getting a liver transplant because <laughs> I would be dead. There's okay. No, yeah. Let's put it in that situation. If I were to, you know, one week you had to fucking have one pop and that's all the only liquid you get. What pop do you want? 
no, don't give me that bubbly <laughs> bullshit because that don't count. <laughs> like a legit, <laughs> like a legit bad, like oh, one that Jesus, like fucks you dude. up, like one that could kill you. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. That sucks. That's a really one week question. of straight, and you have to at least drink six a day. <laughs> wait, so wait, so how much water should you have a day? Can you look that up? Yeah. How much water? <laughs> so on a on an average day, how much water are you supposed to have? Is it a gallon? Um. Yeah. Just look up like how much water are you supposed to have a, a day? Okay. Yeah. So you're recommended I know most to y'all have don't do that. eight eight ounce glasses of water a day, which is about two liters or half a gallon. Which <laughs> so half, a half a gallon a ga- of fucking pop. How that's much disgusting. Is, is half a gallon a liter? It's a, t- a two it's liter pop that two, I can pull out of my fridge right yeah, now. Yeah, go go grab go grab that liter of pop right now and let me know and just sit it <laughs> that you'd have to drink one of those a day. It's a the size day. of my head. Yeah, a day. This is disgusting. If I had to just that. Like that's not disgusting. Your fridge is open, my guy. Um you know, like there's nothing wrong with pop, but like in the situation where you can only have that, I feel like that would I'd be insane. To, I think I'd have to go with Pepsi, man. You would go Pepsi. It's Why not, would it it's be not Pepsi? A Pepsi plug? I don't necessarily like Pepsi, but I think out of all of them, it's my favorite. The favorite taste for me, or Baja Blast. Baja Blast. Fuck. I think Thomas would probably agree with you on God the Baja damn. Blast, but I don't know if he would drink it for a straight week. I know you wouldn't either, but there'd be no way there'd have to be massive money incentive involved and even then but if i had to a month it was a life or t- a month a month i think caffeine's a diuretic i think Could it you like go literally dehydrates you yeah it is god i think i'd die before i'd make it a month dude in middle school i would pound fucking three of those things a day honestly that's true i don't we know. would I don't at know your mom's when we would go to your mom's we'd get like fucking three of those two liters five little caesar five, pizzas five of them knock them down we would just take those to ourselves. I guess that's not that much now that I think about it. Honestly, yeah. A two liter pop a day? We have to think back to a, a time before now. I mean, we're both not big pop drinkers. No, not anymore. Definitely moved away from it. I remember, though, being addicted to Coca Cola's in the summer. Like, I'd come home with a 24 pack and be gone in a weekend <laughs> <laughs> because it's just, I can need more caffeine. It tastes so good. I, it's just like it wasn't even like it gave me a buzz. It just tasted good, right. and it was just like, like I said, it's not boring. It's fizzy. It's, it's fizzy. It's, like it's got f- taste. I feel like you just like the bubbles going down right. your throat. You know, some people just like that. Right. You know, like Baja Blast, like from Taco Bell. <laughs> I don't really eat at Taco Bell, but like the bubbles from that are satisfying. Well, I've heard I've heard from somebody that they've like designed it to be like the most satisfying thing you can drink. You drink what? it and it's just like the best imitation of hydration that they can give. You drink it and you feel refreshed and it's supposed to taste really good with their Dude, food. Dude, there's some deep psycho- psych- psychology shit in it probably. Oh, I'm sure. It looks good to drink. Pull just up a fucking picture of it. Pull uh, it up pull right up, now. Yeah, pull up a cold Baja Blast in like glass. Make or just something. Yeah, cold Baja Blast. It just looks great. People who are listening, uh, look up Baja Blast, you know, the Mountain Dew. If you've never heard of it, it's like Taco Bell is like, you know, their uh, signature for Mountain Dew. And it just looks it's good. Beautiful. It's for people who can't see. It is basically light. Would you say light? It's like a teal. Like a teal. It's like the aqua bo- blue waters of the Bahamas. Yeah, and it's bubbly and it's super cold. A, a it, glacier-filled water lake. So what is that then? What 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 flavor is Baja Blast to you? Like, because <laughs> I know there's been decoders on Reddit. It's yeah. actually Gatorade and Powerade and <laughs> What is it to you? Man, I can't it's, even... If I said, okay, I will give you a million dollars if you could perfectly replicate Baja Blast, what would it be? What ingredients would be... Like, what flavors You get would three be? drinks. You don't... I'm not saying you have to do all the fucking... Right. Like, oh, Jesus, this much sodium man. and this much... It's like a, a mix between... I don't even know. It's such a unique taste. Yeah. It's crazy. I can't even give it... So what is, what is cola, then? That's another thing you can Yeah, what is cold? Caramel? Syrupish? No. It is caramely. Yeah, look at so I'm yeah. I'm taking a swig. Yeah. Yeah, tell me what what does cola taste like to you? It's a pretty just normal taste. Sugary. Sugary. I taste a ton of sugar, maybe a little bit of caramel flavoring or something like that. <laughs> I couldn't like man, just the cola just um in general, really, the it's it's fascinating. It 
Well, uh, it's, uh, to to speak to that. Yeah. To speak to that, like, we've come so far in terms of s- food and what satisfies us as humans. If we go back 100,000 years, we're eating shitty bread and Go grass. 400 years. 400, yeah. 400 years. We don't years. have half of the stuff that we have today that's been crazily manufactured. And, and it's interesting to think how some of these foods have been developed and the science that has gone into some of these foods. The fact that we've used complex science to make some of these foods is both at the same time incredible and somewhat disconcerting because you yeah. think because you think you know energy drinks how yeah. long have they been around 20 years max? if that yeah probably 20 um, years maybe a little longer that's you know if you're drinking them for the last 20 years you have heart problems you have heart problems and you have a bunch of stuff but where's where, what's what's the side effects of of these high caffeinate you know caffeinated things or these highly processed foods what are the side effects of them? What are they going to do to your body if you keep that diet up yeah. over a long period of time? Because we've seen what it happened if you have fucking McDonald's for a month in that documentary. <laughs> you almost die. <laughs> yeah, you could die from shit like that. Food is a fucking interesting topic, man. I would, I mean, if I would, if it was more like okay to sound on here, like I'd eat things on here. Get but some like, ASMR. I just don't want to like weird people out by me chomping in their ear some great mouth sounds yeah, yeah i that. feel like that would be cringy <laughs> like that hot one show with the wings that's an amazing show i love that's that one show uh, um that's a c- super cool idea yeah i love that but it only works with the camera it only works with the camera and this is this is voice i don't want to fucking chew in people's <laughs> ears man this oreo is really good man <laughs> crunch crunch what's an o- what's the middle of an oreo then just vanilla man. that's vanilla it's got to be it's something just like disgusting like you know what i mean I think, yeah like what flavor is it i mean it's oh, vanilla flavor yeah well yeah vanilla vanilla icing something that would drape a cinnabon oh. the frosting of cinnabon is the what frosting it tastes like of, to me yeah cinnabon no. that is obesity that's actual cocaine in it yeah I swear to there, God, there's delicious. when you walk by cinnabon it is something and you're like you get punched in the face by an aroma of god yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, you're going to fucking smell it. I know you probably won't get one, but you're going to at least feel bad for walking by. Your feet lift off the ground momentarily, like you're floating to a pie on a yeah. window stoop. And then you eat one, and you're like, man, I feel like shit. Yep. Oh, God. And you feel like absolute shit. You just ate five pounds of butter. <laughs> <laughs> and you have on early onset diabetes. I mean, like, how much of sugar is in that compared to a can of Coke, though? Because I feel like somewhat coke about has the same man. how much coke how much sugar does coke have in it a startling amount 46 it? grams oh my god 42 grams i remember feels like i'm making you look up a lot of things <laughs> but it's true i remember back in elementary school the health lady would come around and just hold up plastic bags and you're like how much I sugar is it yeah you, you're like that's two plastic bags of sugar in a drink oh how do you even get that 39 grams of sugar in a cup. How much is 39 away. grams? Like, weighing? How much does that weigh? Half a pound? No, no way. No, not no, half. Well, I'm no. crazy. <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's a weight you'd feel in your hand. It's not a, not a small one. I want to feel what that feels like in my hands one of these days. Like, I, I know I've, I, mean, I know I've, like, held it in my hand, right. but, like, you know what I mean? Holy crap, dude. It's almost a pound. Point. It's almost a pound? Wait. No. No, no, no. It's almost a tenth of a pound. I was like, I was about to be like, I that means that all these... 0.08. I was, I was about to be like, these Coke cans would be way more heavier. I know, yeah. Case. I'm an idiot. Maybe they dissolve, though. Maybe. Yeah. God, man. Food, food's awesome. Social gatherings is awesome, too, though. That's another thing. Well, you can use... Food transcends all language and all culture. Yeah. If you know how to make a culture's food well, you have an in. You have a way to connect and and appreciate these people, right? Yeah. I think food is a beautiful way of bringing people together, and it's needed a lot more. It is. Now, as we seem to be in, f- in complete fracture, people seem to be butting off into their own echo chambers. What I do you mean by that? Well, <laughs> I there's just a lot of stuff going on in the world. I personally and anecdotally, I think that there's been a rise in uh, like discrimination. I've noticed definitely in the past two years of more racist encounters and whatnot, and it seems like um, along with social media, everybody's sort of retracting into things that they feel comfortable in and things where their biases and thoughts and prejudices are all affirmed by other people in the, in the 
you know, group that they're in and they don't want to reach across lines. Um, I've been guilty of this. I mean, yeah, it's, it's tough. Um, I want to sit here, for example, a great one mm-hmm. and an incredibly controversial one is police officers. Yeah. I want to sit here and be supportive to the people who, whose job it is, is to keep us safe. Yeah. But you hear stories almost every day about this, uh, just bad things happening to minorities or women or something in the system that makes you think like, man, these people really suck. Mm -hmm. And that, that phrase, these people is the most damaging thing that we could use at this moment because we're generalizing this huge group of people into one thing. We're categorizing them as all one thing. And it doesn't help from any side of the coin, whether you're a flaming racist or completely left on the scale, you know, it doesn't help if you generalize people and put them together or reach across the lines to sort of see a perspective of the other side. Not saying you should try and have a Nazi's perspective, but if you're, if you're friends with someone who's slightly more conservative than you and you don't agree with some of your views, try and find out why you don't agree yeah. with some of your views or why they have those views in the first place. Everybody has a justification for why they think a certain way. And the worst thing we can do is to shun that justification, to shun that, you know, that idea as bad, well, unless it's bad. Of yeah, course. yeah, there could be bad Just things. Trying to trying to have perspective is such an important thing because you can sort of not justify but understand how people think, and then that will help you in changing their mind or help you in interacting with them in the future. People like to act like it's a, a fucking game, like politics. It is a game, but like God. just because like someone stands for something, they're not like ridicule and like they, people think like there's an answer to the Republican way is the way to do it or the Democratic way is the way to do it or the Green Party is the way to do it. Right. There's no, like the thing is with politics, there's n- they just do different things and people think that's the way it should be. Right. And that's just what they believe in and there's nothing wrong with either side of the party. You know, I, I lean on a certain way. You know, I'm not going to announce it because I don't want people getting all fucking, oh, politics, man. Yeah. You know, but fucking, I lean away and people get butthurt about it. Right. You know, and it's just like, it's not like I'm saying this is right. It's just what I stand for. Right. And that could be with fucking anything. Right. People like to just ease it. But to go with what you said about social media, I talked about this with Brian. Um, social media has made it so people can click and make mobs in weird ways. Literal angry mobs. mobs. Not, yeah, not gangs, but it's like mobs. You get hundreds of people attacking somebody for an opinion that they shared. Yeah. Whether or not that opinion is justified or not, it's incredible the dynamic that especially twitter yeah which is so reactionary uh has and you see like it's it's cancerous to look through some replies to politicians sometimes because you see the extremes of each side and it's just baffling how people can think this way and think that it's okay to gang up on people for for pretty minor opinions or attack people because they have this anom- anonymity they showed them Right, yeah. You Some showed tough words him on Twitter. Wow, you man, you what? You got ten retweets on that, <laughs> man. You showed him. Got him. God, I really, yeah, he's burned. Can't show his face in public anymore. Like, I just, I just don't like that. That's the one thing I don't like about Reddit. Yeah, is I go into somewhere and I, I talk about something and, hey guys, real big Raven fan, you know what? What's the salary cap issue? That's just an example. Right. How do you not know with the salary cap issue? I've been a fan since fucking... I've had a tattoo on my arm since I was two years old. I've been the biggest Ravens fan in my life. You don't deserve to be on this forum. Get yeah. the fuck out of yeah, here. Yeah, I'm like, Normie. whoa. And then everyone's like, yeah. Like, what? Like, wow, they showed me. I have a legitimate question that I want to ask, and I'm crucified because I'm not... Google it. that you... Yeah, Google it. God. That's gatekeeping at its finest. That's another massive pet peeve I have is just... Why can't you let someone like something? Like, just because you mo- know more about it, does that make it so it's not okay for everyone who knows less than you to like that thing? Hey, yeah, you think I, Bill Gates is like, oh, you like computers? You're an ass, and then he just drills you. He gets excited, and he you says, know Java? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, what? Do you know how to code? Like, no, no I just like just how they... I enjoy watching YouTube <laughs> on my computer, man. It's, it's a cool thing. People are exhausting. Pe- it is. People are waiting... I feel like people fish for something to be mad about. Oh, God. I think this is so evident in retail and and the food service industry. I have so many stories of my girlfriend coming home. Yeah. Almost in tears. Mm -hmm. Because somebody just lit her up for no reason other than they were projecting something that happened in their own life earlier in the day or earlier in the week 
or earlier in the year or whatever onto somebody else. Most of the time, people aren't actually mad at you, right? No, no. Most of the time, it's something internal that they can't, either they don't understand yet or they can't understand, and they're going to project that anger onto you. It's not justified. It's not okay, but it's like, it's it shows an epidemic ep- epidemic of how many people are bothered. It's exhausting. Age. It is. It's totally exhausting. It's exhausting because in that situation, like I said in the beginning of the show, people are bags. They're just carrying these unnecessary loads of things that they don't need. Right. So, like, say, like, someone is struggling with, I don't know, jealousy. That's a and great. this is a big thing I've been with. I, right. I've been a big jealous person in any relationship, not romantically, just friendships, business relationships, college relationships. Not getting jealous and just truly letting go of that s- fucking gross grossness about right. it is what's really the key of it. But a lot of people do not want to rip that Band-Aid off because it's all they got. Yep. That jealousy is yep. what keeps them maintained and centered. Right. Oh, well, uh, fuck, what's a good example for fucking something like this? No, no, you looked at him. Right. And then you feel like an ass, you you yeah. know, it's gross. Yeah. You know, have you ever been that jealous where you're just like, oh, just burning on the you're inside. You're being such a baby. Right. In your head, you know, it's bad. Yeah. It, you're just like, this is like, you could have a, a male friend or something like that that yeah. they've had long before you came around. Yeah. And they're like, hey, we're going with a group of friends to go ice skating or something. Yeah. Go see oh, you're going to go hang out with your real boyfriend? You're going to go do that? That's really cool. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Like, no. Just let the people have their freedom and understand that jealousy transcends your your critical thinking sometimes. You get past the point of, is this okay or is it not? Because you work yourself up in this frenzy so quickly that you can't apply critical thinking to the situation. You can't apply logic to the situation. And I think that gets some people in trouble, letting that stuff go. Same it's with anger. I feel like there's no win. No. Like, what are they? Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I am going to fucking meet this guy. Then you feel like an ass, right? And then it's true, and then you're butthurt about that. Yep. And then say that, and they're like, no. Then they, it's just abusive to the person you're with, right? It's super like, they're in the, it just sucks. And I, I've been in that situation where I've done that, and I, 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 I feel gross about it, right. even to this day. But I've let go of it, and like, you know what? I can't judge myself in that way, or instantly assume stupid shit because right. I read in between the lines of things I don't need to read in between the lines, right? Of. Right, there's you know? just nothing there. But yeah. you're prejudiced to assume that something is there because of, oh, I've had friends that have gone through this. Hollywood. And this is how it happened. Oh, great, yeah. Thanks, Hollywood. Any TV, any movie that exists out there of like a cheating couple or whatever instantly puts this, oh, man, this is happening in your head when most of the time it's not. Yeah, it, like, yeah. so people could be dealing with any type of shit, anything, and they just want to portray it on you. Right. That's what road rage road rage is. Oh yeah. I don't even believe that road rage is a thing because it's just everyone's just pissed at right. something. And then as soon as something happens, they're pissed. Someone yep. cuts them off. Fuck you. <laughs> you Screaming, know? throwing stuff. Because I never get like I'm having a good ass day. Someone cuts me off. I'm like, all right, I let them in. Yep. But when I'm pissed off that day, yeah, fuck this guy. I'm gonna tailgate him all yep. the way to his destination. <laughs> I'm gonna speed up and get in front of him or just totally worthless stuff that honestly endangers more people than it does good for I just because press of your this anger. gas pedal harder than him therefore I am yeah. better than him. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that's what I never get to oh, you know what I realized too paying to win hasn't just been a new thing in video games it's been forever think yeah. of that think of that because you know like in video games now you're like oh pay to win fucking dumb right it's been like that forever dude we played Madden in 2012 yeah and in 2011, in middle yeah. school. People would buy packs. We were using them. our parents' credit cards to buy freaking coins so we could play. Yeah. This is not a new thing. Pay yeah, to win is never... It almost it creates a second class of gamers in the, in the system who have the money to advance their profile or whatever. Yeah. A character or whatever to the point where you just can't beat it unless you spend money. Yeah. So you have everybody who spends money and everybody who doesn't spend money. The people who don't spend money are guilted into spending money because they can't win or they're not good enough to compete with the people who have spent money. It's a crazy system. Clash of Clans is a great example yes, of that. Yes, pay to win. Pay to win. Freemium games, they call it. Yep. You just can't advance. EA Sports, uh, they're their... Um, Madden Ultimate Team. Yep. Or the Star Wars Battlefront. 
Oh, whatever. that was some crazy shit. Yeah. What happened again? They were like charging people. I don't remember exactly the, what the specifics were, but it sounded, or the, what I remember is people would have to play like 500 game hours or something like that to unlock all of the characters without pain. <laughs> Like oh you have to play an ungodly amount of the game just to get like some like Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, some like the players known, they want to play, yeah. or you buy them for a hundred something dollars. A hundred. I, I I could be conflating the numbers. Yeah, but, yeah. But I remember being flabbergasted by the stats of like what you had to do just to beat the game or get the things that you want in the game, and it's like at the. <laughs> Sure, you can sell that for sixty bucks, and people are going to eat it up because of Star Wars. Everybody yeah. loves Star Wars, but there has to be a point where the consumer says, "No, this isn't okay. We want something that's better." We're paying. We've been paying sixty dollars for games for however long. Yeah, and they used to be great, but now I have to pay one hundred fifty more dollars once I buy the game just to be on the same level as most people or people who are beating me. So it takes away from the fun of the game. That's smart. It is. It, it, it's fucking genius. It's but it <laughs> sucks. It's a great it's a great business it's model. It's a great but business model, but then you're like the people who actually love video games. I buy Mario Party four on the GameCube. I get Mario Party four. Get all of it. I get <laughs> everything in Mario Party four. You know? And I, I know there's games out there that are I mean, is there games like that anymore? I would say Red Dead, but their online beta's got Yeah. Got the the stuff to buy and I, I am a fan of the ones that you could buy things but they don't give you any advantages yeah like Fortnite's yeah. cosmetic upgrades it's right. like okay yeah buy the skin uh, if you want a cool skin you can waste your money on yeah it. but cool, you don't but you could that's a totally free game to play right and that's super cool that is I, I do appreciate it's that lighting a fire under everyone's ass too yeah we've seen how many battle royale remakes have come out cod it's and now those generation. guys gotta do weekly updates all the time because Fortnite did it yeah. And, you know, I look at it, I'm like, dude, Fortnite's fucking kicking ass. And a lot of people like to hate, but they're doing something right there. Yeah. Uh, they got a lot of little kids, though. You know, a lot of little kids like to play it. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it, but. It's for the next generation. It's like that with everything, though. Cars. Mm-hmm. Look back to 10, 15. Tr- when for cars first came out, you spent more money, you get something better. Yep. It goes like that with anything, though. Right. You spend more money, you get a better fridge. You spend more money, you get better tables spend money you get better computers right you know yeah and there's nothing wrong with it but it just sucks that some things are like that right and and i wonder to a point if there is a point where it becomes wrong where you're just overpricing something because people are going to pay that much money for the name or whatever it may not be worth it Mm -hmm. um so what do you think think of art like that then sorry to interrupt you sorry what'd you say what do you think of people like paying $50,000 $50,000 for a canvas half the size of this wall. Art. Oh, man. See, that's... Do you think that's more of a subtle flex? Or do you feel like there actually is some art that can be worth that much? I've... Like, going to the Seattle Art Museum, there are definitely some pieces in there that blow my mind in a way that I can't understand. Like, yeah. Cannot understand. Yeah. Or touch an emotion that I didn't know I had. Yeah. Art is an incredible way to express yourself, and I think that is more so to express yourself, express emotion, and then to receive that sort of, like, you look at something and you see something that you can relate to. I think that's more so what the price is being put on, is the feeling that it evokes when you have it. And some of these artists are incredibly talented to to have a, A you know, a 10 by 10 mural with so much detail put in that's easily worth thousands, you know, even millions of dollars. Um, but then you have people who put big dots on a 20 foot canvas that I could do with my eyes closed. (laughs) Um, you call it abstract or whatever. I've tried it. It's pretty fun. Oh dude, that stuff's fun. It's great, but it's not worth billions of millions of dollars. It's not worth this huge amount of money because it, I don't know. But even then arts, 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 a difficult thing to unpack because there are, what? Ways to justify you can't even spending that much it. money. Like you, you know, there is a definition for yeah. art, but yeah, this is technically an art. Music, what we're doing right yeah. now, Painting. talking. Yeah, you know, music is a fucking big art. People have been doing art since. I think that's what makes art super cool. Is it's been around forever. forever. People have been painting forever. Mm-hmm. People have been talking forever. People have been writing, making beats with rocks right. and fire right. and 
since forever. That's what makes it so cool. Like, I even said, I'm going to ask you this one. Okay. What would, what would, if you were to bring, you would get, you know, shot <laughs> if you were to bring something like dubstep into <laughs> the 1700s. Oh, man. But if you had to bring like a song to the past, do you think it would like, what do you think music would be like if they like took that and like now and then and then ran with that as like an inspiration or something? Yeah, like that. imagine oh, if you wow. brought fucking like brought Jimi Hendrix album there holy, and then they like started a couple there. of guitars and stuff and oh my god, what would it be now? Well, it's crazy to think just how far we've come from the '60s and and I guess as a as a length of time from where we come from to see this crazy new world of music made exclusively on electronics without any like traditional instruments blowing up and having f- massive festivals and having a huge following and whatnot. Um, it's crazy to think like we brought a couple of guitars and drums back then and gave them to people in the 1400s. Where would we be now in, in music production? What would we be using to create music? It's, it's almost impossible for me to think about like how, how that would change the world. It would be insane. Yeah. Like our our music would be I don't know it what we we would have cuz there's new genres that pop up every 10 5 new there's new genres of music coming out all the fucking time. Well we have we have this way to share it with everyone on the planet now. Yeah. Everybody can find inspiration. I an artist that just popped up for me recently has got a very s- small following but it's exploded over the past yeah. few months because you can just be anybody. You can be an anybody right now and create a SoundCloud account throw a couple of songs up there and if they're good they're going to spread like wildfire you have this opportunity to become massive overnight and then that inspires other people who will become massive overnight and this trend and and evolution of music is just the snowball effect where it starts as the small thing tripping around popping off the radio in the 60s and 70s through rock and roll then we get tv and mtv we have music videos yep. playing 24 7 then we have a way to share it with YouTube, and now all of a sudden Streaming. you can go on your phone and computer and see your favorite artists or artists who have 10 followers who just started. You can see every type of genre at your fingertips, and then you can take two genres and mix them together and make your own. We're at this exponential point in music and everything, really, technology, literature, art, where everything's just going to explode. We're going to see things that are never been done before, never been thought of before, because we have ways for people to be inspired in ways they've never been inspired before. Do you, do you, here's another thing a lot of people like to do too. They like to discredit people nowadays because there's no instruments. But dude, the, some of those producing things, like making those beats. That's say an th- instrument in its own. Yeah, you dude, need that's to have fucking, skill. That is fucking skill. That's like, incredible. You know, maybe some of these like rappers don't know how to, strum a guitar or play the piano but damn sure they know how to fucking make a beat that goes oh just God. as hard as a solo yeah and like i would i always try to stick up for people who you know the people are like oh well that's just you know today's music not the same yes it's not but it's also it's totally different yeah you know it, it there's a lot of things going on the, are you telling me the post production nowadays for a fucking Lil Uzi song oh my god compared to you know, back then, like it's way more intense. Yeah, like this guy scenes. has seventeen instruments going at one time right. with a guy saying "muster on the beat" in the background. Right. And it's like, I don't get it. It's, it's inspiring. It's super yeah. cool. Yeah. I wish I could get a. I want to learn more about right. it. More about music. Definitely. Yeah. We're even poking around on GarageBand. Yeah. It's difficult to make something that sounds good mm-hmm. with the tiny limited tools that you have there that are translated for you in the most plain sense. <laughs> Like, it's the easiest tool to work with, yet it still st- baffles my mind it's sometimes. foreign to me. And so I see, you know, musicians on Instagram will post pictures of tracks that they're working on on their computer, and it's just like 40 different instruments going at the same time on this almost alien-looking program. And it's amazing to see people who read this like a language. Like, it's their, you know, first language, and they just can do it in their sleep. <laughs> It's crazy, absolutely crazy. People probably look at the same way at that as they look at planes, dude. For you, <laughs> what started it with planes? I I unfortunately don't have that magical story. Yeah, that that other people have. Like, oh, I, my grandpa landed a plane in the backyard and mm-hmm. took me up, and I was hooked. Like, I every moment of my life, I've remembered 
being in love with aviation. Mm-hmm. My mom's got pictures of me at two years old looking up at airplanes going over. So there was never a moment. Mm-hmm. It was just always something that's going to happen. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess people, I've definitely had the reaction of like, wow, that's, yeah, that's crazy. You must be super smart. And like, I'm not that smart. I'm not that much different from an average person. It just takes like everything, practice and diligence. Um, and especially for something that has so many regulations, so many tests and so much red tape you have to run through before you can actually do the thing. It takes a great passion to get there. I wonder how long it's going to take until aviation is like aviation ed, like driver's ed. Yeah, man. I I don't know if it will ever get to that point in our lifetime. With it, we're, we're hitting this weird cross, yeah. this weird intersection where like aviation is the most f- efficient form of traveling if you want to get somewhere in the most efficient amount of time. But it's a massive polluter at the same time. Yeah. And we are at the precipice of some terrible, terrible, terrible stuff that that will happen over our lifetime, whether we stop some we stop this you know, out of control train that we've started or not. Bad things are gonna happen. So the the face of vehicles in general is gonna change drastically. And I'm honestly excited for it. I'm honestly excited to see what an electric airplane looks like, what an electric airliner looks like, or what a renewable, you know, sourced power plant looks like in terms of people transport and whatnot. So is that a thing now? We've (laughs) we're not there yet, but there's definitely there's a couple of uh, I think there's one company in Italy and then a few in the United States who are making electric airplanes that are good enough to be flown in flight schools around the pattern. They have an hour and a half or two hours of battery time a solar powered airplane just flew around the world that's fucking so dope we're getting to some some crazy technological advances that need to happen for the sustainability of humans Dude, on this planet you've been in a plane since fucking i met you like people like i even said when i left the open gym today i'm going to interview ryan for podcast and everyone ryan the flying guy like it's like <laughs> that's your staple right and a lot of people need to find their staple and right. like you know the thing is like we were in eighth grade and you told me you were looking at this computer screen on your fucking ThinkPad. Oh I think it probably God. took you five minutes to even load this <laughs> application. And it literally, you look like a fucking a legit pilot, but it could be used in a wrong way. You had every flight that was coming into Payne Field or wherever field, and I was like, you're like, yeah, I'm not supposed to have this. And I was like, at that moment, I knew. I was like, this guy's fucking going to do something like plane related. And, like, it was inspiring. Like, you know, looking at that when you don't really know what you wanted. Like, me personally, I'm like, fuck, man. That's deep shit. Right. And I, I, I look at that, and I'm like, this guy loves planes more than anything. You could look up in the fucking air and say, that is the fucking Cessna blank blank. Right. And I was like, that. I thought that was just a plane, you know? I don't look at it like that. And, like, like we just said, for music, we look at that, and we're like, well, what is that fucking, you know, that alien thing? Right. That is alien to people that aren't into things right and it's so cool to ask questions and I, I love to ask you questions about that because aviation is super interesting and i remember when i first went up to the when we when you land when you flew when you co-landed or landed the plane i was fucking scared out of my mind dude <laughs> he was like we got done washing these planes me and ryan and the guy's like yeah let's go flying this guy ryan gets in the co-pilot seat you know we're 16 yeah 17, six fucking team this guy landed a plane Go fucking follow this guy. I appreciate it. And he that. was like, yeah. And I was like, all right, I'm in the back seat. Fucking low key. I'm not really a big plane guy in general. Right. And I was like, I, but I was like, I trust my guy, Ryan, man. And as soon as he said, all right, you're on, Ryan, because I could hear everything in my thing. I was like, yeah, all right, man. If he fucks up, I'm like, at least we were, we're going out together. <laughs> <laughs> and he fucking landed it like it was no problem. Like, I've had worse landings in fucking SeaTac Airport, my guy. <laughs> I. I, you're bumping the ego up right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was fucking like I, I've i landed in San Francisco. I don't know if you've ever landed in San Francisco. No. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's probably pretty hard, yeah. all that water around there. But, man, things came out of the fucking luggage. Like, sh- sh- shit was hitting people. <laughs> people were like, man, this guy ain't getting no clap this time. Like, they just <laughs> stood there <laughs> with their arms crossed. Biggest pet peeve in the entire planet. <laughs> yeah. I swear, every time I'm on an airplane and everybody bursts out clapping, like yeah what's your thought you what, hate it what's the alternative here oh god let's clap because he didn't kill us he did his job yeah 
<laughs> Congrats, man. You did your, your job you're being paid to do. Do we so clap at McDonald's employees for giving my large fries? <laughs> Thank you. Your service to us is just I hate that when people <laughs> clap. You know what I hate? The most thing I think I hate is when we're on an airplane, you know, plane lands, everyone just stands oh and gets in the way. like Because you know you – so you get to the, the terminal. Yeah, yeah. And you know you're sitting and you're driving. You're like, oh, fuck, I think I'd on your phone, get and text everyone. Call call me. I'm, I'm at the terminal. Be there in a little bit. Right. Get to the terminal gate, and then it's like five minutes for them to like open the door and then put in whatever. Put the th- air yeah. stairs in and everything. Yeah. And then people are standing. Like as soon as the, they feel the plane stop. Yeah. <laughs> straight up in their <laughs> seats. Because that door is going to open any second. We need to freaking sprint out of there. And then there's open that guy the who has his luggage 10 seats back. I I can't I can't complain though because when we went to Washington D.C. a few years ago and end of middle school went on this awesome school trip and I had to put my shit all the way in the back of the airplane I'd walk like seven rows back no I, I've never been stared at like I've been stared <laughs> at on that airplane before <laughs> if looks could kill they would people have hated you forty seven gunshot wounds to the head <laughs> if if people had any sort of I wouldn't. <laughs> they were just shooting you shooting daggers. with AKs. Yep. Dude, I I I'm I do that to people. I'm like, "You fucking bitch." Yeah, like I hate have you. Have some forethought. Or when people bring on these fucking huge on carry-ons. <laughs> the size oh of a f- this table and they're like, "Oh, it will fit. It will not fit." It's fucking not gonna fit. Ta- check it. You have a 70-inch TV. Yeah. It's not going to fit in overhead. <laughs> and then the 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 you know the uh God, the um, people who work on oh, like, uh, flight attendants, flight attendants, come up and they're like, "Sir, it's uh, <laughs> I don't and know." And they if try this is so hard, fit, man. Those those flight attendants low key probably got some biceps. Oh yeah, they'd be lifting and some up some patience. <laughs> Do you know how much? Could you imagine being paid twenty five dollars an hour to sit on an airplane for fifteen hours from here to China or something like that? I would be no, thank you. You have to. You probably learn everybody's name and face. Because you're just stuck with the same 120 people for that long. Oh, that one dick who's gonna be a dick for 18 hours. Ugh. I I have so much respect for cabin crew and people who have to deal with just some characters. I don't like the airport. Yeah, I I don't like airports, man. I the thing is with airports is I just feel like it's just. So serious for oh some. My God. The security's a pain in the ass. People smell. People fucking. Oh, I'm only going to the airport. Fucking shower. I don't care. I know. I want to fucking be plus like have, have some hygiene. Yes, and then like I always get there early, and I just sit at the gate for two hours, and everything's pure overpriced. Anxiety, yeah, and like I'm like we're gonna die, but even though it's like technically more statistical, like I could die yeah. in my car than a plane. Yeah. More likely to die walking down the street than in a plane. Climb. Really? Yeah, planes are the only reason you hear about the death of planes or people dying from planes is because when a plane crashes, you're probably going to die because of the speeds and the altitudes that yeah. are involved. But in 2017, I think I have geeks out there. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we had a single major airline accident. Hey, which is a huge, huge, huge thing. Like some uh, an air traffic controller recently during the government shutdown said. Um, if you do your job 99% efficient uh, in most jobs, no one's going to bat an eye. But if you do your job 99% efficient as an air traffic controller, it means you lose 50,000 airplanes a day. Oh, my like God. across the whole system. Don't those guys have the – they're the most – it's the most stressful job in yeah. the world. Only allowed to work for an hour at a time. And what? you have to take a break. So what do you do as an air traffic control? So um, – You're in the tower. Yeah, so you have, you have a different – couple different types of air traffic controllers. You have your air traffic controllers who are at, like – Say Seattle Tacoma International Airport, for example. People who sit up in the tower, they say you're cleared to take off, cleared to land, direct people through gates and whatnot. Their job is to make sure planes get to and get out of the airport safely. But as soon as you're in the air, especially for the airline guys who are traveling at r- tremendous speeds, almost instantly you're handed off to another air traffic controller w- in what's called a center. And those are the people that make sure you're flying your route the way you need to fly. Like, say you're flying to L.A., they're the people who are telling you to fly to 35,000 feet and turn left at this heading, turn left here. You're going to talk to this guy next, get that punched into your radio book. You end up talking, like, if you were to fly, if you're a pilot and you're flying an IFR, like a commercial flight from Seattle to L.A., you probably end up talking to 
five or six different people on the radio, all of them being air traffic controllers and all of them holding your life and the lives of everybody behind you in their hands. Because they're telling you what to do. Right. You really? can't see any other airplanes out there. You can see, you have collision avoidance systems and whatnot, but those are only so effective. The air traffic controllers are your eyes. Because you got to think, you have two airplanes coming at each other at the same altitude, each going about 550 miles an hour. That's 1,100 miles an hour at a closing speed. That's a, you know, a rifle round. That's a sniper bullet. Yeah. That's a blink of an eye. So you could be a mile away one second, you look down at your instruments, and you look back up, and all of a sudden, an airplane's in your windscreen. Oh, my God. So these people have clouds to be... Aren't, yeah, you guys clouds, don't like clouds either, right? You can't see anything in a cloud. You have to look at your instruments. It's actually taught you don't look outside when you're flying in a cloud because you get this thing called spatial disorientation. You don't know which way is up. You don't know which way is down. Um, people have flown into clouds not having the correct training and just pulled the stick back until they stalled the airplane and slammed into the ground because they thought they were in a dive the entire time. Oh my clouds God. do some really trippy stuff to you. So, yeah, imagine flying 500 miles an hour in a cloud near another airplane. Like You need an air traffic controller to be there to say, hey, we have traffic two miles away to make a right turn to this heading. Or so you else. work an hour a day. Well, you like in hour intervals, like in hour, hour intervals, yeah, yeah. Because you're you're constantly going. Yeah, because you work uh, at a busy airport. Let's take Atlanta for example. Uh, Av geeks again, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Not air traffic controller here, but I would say more than 600 planes in that hour, maybe more. Landing and taking off. Mm -hmm. Fuck. You have to remember where this plane's going, what clearances has, how high does it need to turn, does it have a special departure? departure clearance you need to know everything about whatever airplane's moving at the same time so it's just this incredible stress like i if if you're out there wa listening go on youtube look up crazy air traffic controller compilations and you can just hear the stress in these guys voice what? you can hear i'm gonna look guys. this yeah. up because they, they have to talk to so many different airplanes so many different call signs all on the same radio frequency so people could be talking over each other you could be talking to somebody and then somebody who wasn't on the frequency a second before comes on and talks so the, your your instruction is lost in the airwaves. It's it's crazy. How crazy is it when someone is trying to surprise land or not surprise like emergency land? Are they just like oh. fuck? It's just another headache. I bet for them. Yeah. Well, um, I know that the system out there to protect people from emergencies is the best in the world yeah. in the United States. So they'll get um, you to land. Yeah. Most well, mostly what happens, I think, is they ha like say you're a center controller and Kay. you're directing somebody from one place to another and they call you and say hey we just had an engine failure we need to get on the ground right now i think what would happen is you would hand off the other flights that you're controlling to somebody yeah. else and your main purpose is that one airplane making sure that one airplane gets on the ground without killing anybody else that's fucking cool though yeah that's training and a half oh like, yeah what is and then another last question before because i know you know it's getting kind of late here but the last question i gotta ask what is it like say president trump or you know president obama's flying into seattle what are they doing? Nobody is nobody even allowed to be in the air at that time around them. So they do they have clearance or something like that? Right. So like you're not even allowed to be like look at them kind of thing in the air. <laughs> it's um, uh, it's a personal experience with this. Yeah. Uh, Oso back in 2014 when Washington had the landslide out near Darien. Yeah, and Obama came and Obama, talked. Yeah, he came and visited the site and everything. Um, and me being the aviation lover I have, I got to get out and see Air Force One. Yeah. We show up at Payne to uh watch him take off out of, out of Payne Field in Everett. And the Secret Service walks around with massive guns, telling, screaming at everybody, get in your cars, lock your doors, get in your cars, lock your doors. Because what? they didn't want anybody on any sort of vantage point looking at the helicopters that were bringing him in or watching the airplane take off because they didn't want anybody to either shoot at him, blow him up, whatever. It was an incredible amount of security, uh, probably the most security I've ever seen anywhere. Um, that's the civilian side. Yeah. The aviation side is it shuts down the airspace. It causes a <laughs> massive. That's so a headache. It's a big headache. There's a like a 90 minute ground stop before and after the the How plane hard lands. is that? You can't do anything if you're if you boarded an airplane and like are taxiing to the runway and the president shows up out of nowhere, you're stuck on the runway for 90 minutes while they land and and deboard and make sure the president's secure. Um, if you're within 100 miles and you fly into the restricted airspace, fighter jets are going to be scrambled from the nearest place coming at you at Mach 2 with Sidewinder missiles ready to shoot you down because they how? don't take threats lightly. Wait, so yeah, so how fast? Okay, so say, okay, let's just 
you know, hypothetically, so, like there was a threat to the right. president when he's in the air. And like, how fast would it take? Like, say someone threatens him, how fast can like, one of those planes get to him? Man. So, um, they'll be like, all right. A matter of minutes, really. Minutes? Like, where uh, are they even at? I th- so we've got. In the water? They're on the water. Um, it's usually an Air Force jet that's scrambled from an Air Force base. Yeah. And this is like one of my favorite things to talk about is speed in aviation because, um, dude, go on. There's this, there's, I think an event that happened last year or something with, with Donald Trump flying somewhere and someone like a light airplane plane that I would fly a little four seater, single engine piston airplane breaks the TFR from like, what's that? Uh, temporary flight restriction. Okay. Sorry. So like the restriction around the president, you're not allowed to fly in. Oh, okay. Um, like a little bit. Yeah. So he, he breaks it, flies in, probably not knowing that it's active these f-15s from like 400 miles away scramble they're there in three minutes three. Mach two we're talking 15 to 1600 miles an hour which is faster than a speeding bullet it's faster than most like rifle rounds these <laughs> things are moving across the sky faster than freaking bullets and they can get places they're going faster than a mile a second at at points oh my god so they god. can get places instantly um, so yeah, it's like less than 10 minutes. You're going to be intercepted by a flight of airplanes. If you, if you break into, uh, do they shoot you or do they just fucking, well, they'll come up right next to you. They'll show you that they've got guns <laughs> and then they'll switch to your frequency and say, you land at this airport and you talk to these people and what's going to happen is you're going to get, th- you're going to get your license taken away. You're basically you're screwed. screwed. <laughs> you're done. LeBron James just dunked yep. on you. That's Enjoy what happened. Enjoy that landing. Cause it's the last one you'll be making. <laughs> oh um, my God. So does Donald Trump or president, you right. know, does he get to fly at a certain height where like people are like, all right, you're not allowed to go this height or since he, he just follows the general rules of whatever the plane is. Cause um, I know commercial airliners can, what are they? 30,000 feet. It's uh so like between 18,000, which we call flight level one eight zero yeah. and uh 60,000 feet flight level six zero, um, six zero zero, uh, is basically the range in which most commercial airliners fly. Or if you file what's called an instrument flight rules plan, which means you're flying just off of your instruments alone. Um, you usually cleared through those flight levels, but for Air Force One, you know, they do whatever they, they want. do whatever they want <laughs> because they have the complete control of the airspace wherever they go. There's no airplanes in their way. There's nobody messing with them on any, you know, on anything. So they can fly as high as they want. They can fly as low as they want. They can fly with as many airplanes around them, like jet, military jets, as they want. So you're in the air. Yeah. And say there's a threat. How do they fucking enter? Like radio you. Or like do you so, say like you're in the air, you know, just somewhere in the right. air. So just, you're just flying, just flying to fucking Shalan. Right, having a good time. And all of a sudden there's a, you know, those. Oh, okay, okay, do, like an attack you, or something. Yeah, like do that. you know, do they say, hey, everyone fucking move yeah. or go low because we're fucking flying through? So a great example of this is 9-11. Yeah. When 9-11 happened, there was a three-day ground scrap across, of, I think, like most of the world where every airplane that was in the air was told by air traffic control, land right now. Don't take off. Um, Damn. And Three I think, days? I think under, like, within an hour or something, a very small amount of time. I can't I can't say the time for sure, but a small amount of time, every airplane that was in the air was on the ground. Some airports had to park planes on the runways because they just ran out of room. Um, so you're flying, and whatever frequency you'll be on, you'll hear an alert that basically says, get out of the sky as soon as possible. There's a threat. Um, and you have no, like, if you don't land, you get shot down, basically. Fuck. Could you imagine don't. that fucking radio call? Oh. If you were to say you're just going to Schland just for a little Man. good time, get on the fucking ground or we'll shoot you. You're like, okay. Okay. <laughs> I am there. <laughs> I'm good. So then, do, so then, in that situation, you're flying. You're like, all right, I got to land. What do you do? Well, you fucking, do you radio in or... When you fly next to an aircraft control, their job is to reach out to you. You don't reach to them, right? Um, well, actually, it's... Uh, if you create a lot of issue, if you fly into an air traffic control zone without establishing contact, mm-hmm. actually one of the requirements for most of the airspaces out there is you establishing two-way contact with the air traffic control. So let's say I'm flying to, land to kind of thing. Yeah. So let's let's say I'm flying from like Arlington here in Arlington, which doesn't have a tra- air traffic control tower. It's a Payne Field, which does have an air traffic control tower. I need to take off dial up the frequency for pain field and say, Hey, I'm Cessna November two, three, zero, whatever, 10 miles to the North. And I want to land. That would be my initiation of contact. And then they'd tell me what I need to punch into my little, uh, squawk and, and 
the instructions for me to come in and land. So there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of redundancy in aviation to make sure it's safe. And that uh, always includes telling what kind of plane you're flying, what your registration is, by b like basically saying your license plate number for a car, but for an airplane. And um, making sure that air traffic control acknowledges that they heard you and gives you instructions back or else things can get really messy really fast. Damn, yeah. I'm I'm guessing they so can do they charge you for landing? I'm that's guessing. A, that's a good question. And uh like if you were to I'll land, go, in, I'll go like into my plug here if yeah, I could. Yeah. Um do whatever you, yeah, dude, plug whatever you got. Um aviation's becoming s sadly restrictive. Yeah. Because of how much it costs to break into it. Just just some raw numbers. I've spent well over ten thousand dollars getting my pilot's license and then getting current again because you have to take tests every certain you know, every so often, every year, basically, to prove that you can still fly an airplane. Um, and everything costs money. It's like $100 an hour to rent an airplane. Gas is 3 or $4 more expensive than car gas per gallon. It's incredibly prohibitive. And then to your point that you were saying before about airports, yeah, they feel like prisons. You have to go through so much security. You get, have to strip down and put your hands up to see a big radar thing go around and x-ray your body just to see if there's a threat on you it it deters people really um and it makes it hard for people to latch onto that passion without feeling attacked yeah or feeling like they can't get into it because honestly right now all it is is for people who make hundred thousand dollars a year and can have enough money to supplement that passion and there's i feel like there's plenty of people out there like me work a 40 hour a week construction job just to scrape by who love airplanes or love something that is prohibitively expensive for them to get into which it just doesn't need to be in 1940 1950 Cessna was making airplanes that cost in today's money as much as a new car yet wow. a new airplane that's four seats easily is half a million dollars do you that think a lot no of this sense. changed after 9-11 then I think so it's it's become a lot more <sighs> but then it's, uh, then again I can't ever disagree with something that makes air travel more safe Oh yeah, dude. So it's it's this crazy catch twenty two of how do we make sure that we're safe in the air? People who want to do bad things can't access the things they need to do the bad things, i.e., an airplane or whatever. Mm -hmm. But how do we make it so when you drive by an airport, you don't feel like you're going to get shot at if yeah. you go up to the fence and try and look at an airplane, or you're not going to get attacked by somebody? And um, it goes into the, what pilots are going to need here, what the aviation industry is going to need here in the next. 10 years I think it's forecasted that we're going to need 900,000 pilots and aviation people in the aerospace coming in that's a ton of jobs damn do a we even have that much though right now no there's no interest so in it's it. like if you're not going to make it easy we're all going to be like I'm not saying make it easy right but right like people got to get interested to into yeah. it because we're if not like and you're the saying price, we're the fucked. price needs to come down that's yeah. the bottom line because you can't have people who love the craft but are living in poverty, they just cannot, you just cannot afford to spend $100,000 it takes to get your airline transport pilot's license as well as all the other ratings that you need to be an airline pilot or to be a cargo pilot or be whatever kind of pilot you want to be. You just can't spend that kind of money um, unless you have money coming in from other sources, parents, whatever the case. Uh, scholarships help, but there needs to be more. There needs to be more that is done to help foster interest Outreach. in this community. Yeah, because we're going to get to the point where flights are going to be canceled. People are not going to be able to get to their destination because we just don't have the resources. We have the planes, but nobody to fly them. That's so we, yeah, so I know like for the average people, who, you know, like me, I know there's Boeing and right. then what's the other one? Airbus. Airbus, Airbus is, is like the okay, like they're the other and they're not here. Yeah, they're based out of uh Germany and France. So they're they're the next but is is Boeing better than them? Or um, is it like pretty too there's <laughs> there's two big camps to this. Yeah. Um, I live 10 miles from Boeing, so I'll always be in the Boeing. Yeah. Camp. But Airbus has done some pretty miraculous things in automation of airplanes, which is another crazy thing. Like, how are people going to be feeling when your plane doesn't have a pilot anymore? Oh. Like we're moving towards that. How do you feel about it? I don't like my job being taken <laughs> yeah, from me. It's <laughs> but, um, do you trust it? Uh. I would have to, there'd have to be some very strict policies, some very strict regulations around it, but I could get to a point where I trust it. If we can have Tesla having the autopilot avoid crashes now in 2019 on the road, saving people's lives, 
it's not a stretch that we could have that in an airplane where you're less likely to hit another airplane. You have so much less things to hit. The only critical phases of flight that that occur is takeoff and landing. Those those are things where you need to be actively present. Um, I know you can go on YouTube and see videos of this. Modern airplanes have an auto land feature. If the weather's bad enough, you just dial in your glide slope, dial in what you need for an ILS uh, instrument landing yeah. approach, and you hit a button, and the plane will fly all the way down to the runway, start to flare, and land itself. All you have to do yeah. is monitor the systems. So we're on the precipice of seeing a fully automated aircraft come out. It's just a matter of, is that something you're going to trust? People like to think that's not hard. Right. Dialing in some a code that's perfectly representing of what you're doing to to oh it's yeah, autopilot the, oh yeah right. you dial in you the fucking code the then asshole <laughs> fucking get over it get over yourself right hate that and what happens when it malfunctions and you got to do it instant instant excuse yeah just instant yep. butt hurtness yeah <laughs> always an excuse for everything dude I fucking yeah I could talk aviation with you forever but I know it's getting late <laughs> and man this has been a fucking fantastic podcast bro I agree we've, we've covered a, a shit ton of things. Awesome things. Yeah, yeah, man. Where could people find you? Because I know a lot of people may be into aviation. Maybe they want to ask you a couple questions themselves. Yeah. Well, um, I've got two Instagrams. One I'm going to be rekindling here as I start to get more active in the, the media world, and that's Ryan the Flying Guy. Ryan the Flying, like not flying with a G, but flying with an N guy on Instagram. And I'm, that's also the same handle for Twitter. And then my personal one, where I share nature photos and whatnot, is Ryan the Climber. Yeah, go give this guy a follow, guys. If you guys got any questions, I'm pretty sure Ryan will give you more than just an answer. Oh, yeah. He'll probably give you a, like a – just know – you know what you should do when you if you add Ryan on Instagram and you're going on a flight, just be like, all right, I'm going to this city and see if he could guess what fucking plane you're on because I bet you he fucking could. Oh, yeah. I'd so, if you're going somewhere, hit me up. I'll help you save some money too. I know all the good websites. Yeah, wait. So if I'm going to New York, what plane am I going to take? Oh, it depends what airline you fly. If I, if I fly Alaska. Probably 737-900ER. That's fucking dope. See, that that, that <laughs> shit's cool, man. This has been episode fucking five of the Dom Dose Podcast with Ryan Kraut, Kraut Kramer. Everyone have a fantastic day. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure.